Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Forging of Modern Australia here at the uh, Melbourne Writers Festival. We're very delighted that you could join us for this presentation. Paul Kelly uh, is an incomparable commentator in Australian political life, and his insight is revered uh, both from those within the system and those of us also practising the craft. Paul is, of course, um, the editor-at-large of the Australian newspaper, former editor-in-chief, and has had a long and distinguished career, including winning several Walkley Awards for lifetime achievements. Uh, and uh, we might kick off with his discussion tonight before we turn to uh, Tony Abbott, who is, of course, himself, uh, as of this year, a, a noted author about politics, as well as uh, his previous contributions to uh, authorship in uh, books about the Constitution and constitutional reform in Australia. So without further ado, can I invite Paul Kelly to set the stage for our discussion this evening about the forging of modern Australia and the continuum between the uh, Keating and Howard years in the last couple of decades. <clears throat> it's great to be in Melbourne of a Saturday night. I don't often get to Melbourne of a Saturday night. And it's a particular pleasure to be at this Writers' Festival. Um, I'm here for the first time uh, as an author for MUP and I've known Louise Adler for many years and now I'm contracted to her. Uh, she and her team have been fabulous uh, in this first book I've written uh, for them. Uh, the March of Patriots is the story of the struggle for modern Australia, a struggle that you're all interested in and many of you are active participants in. This book is not about factional politics. It's not about political tactics. It's about Australia's direction in economic, cultural, social and foreign policy terms. It's a book about prime ministerial government. It's about power and it's about the policies that have defined Australia over the last generation. I've tried to write the inside account of how Paul Keating and John Howard governed and of the ideas that they brought to office and developed in office and how they changed Australia forever. It's about how they went to war, how they tried to save the economy, how they strove for a better society, their achievements and their failures. The book's taken six years to research and write, but in truth, however, it's nearly 40 years in the making. I first met Paul Keating in 1971, a very youthful Paul Keating, filled with energy, even in those days, with a genius at winning the patronage of older men, a young man who was never afraid to make enemies, who seemed even at an early age to be preparing to sit at a table opposite Sahato, Bill Clinton and Bob Hawke. And then in 1974, after his election to the National Parliament, I met John Howard for the first time. As soon as you looked him in the face, you knew here was uh, a man born to the Liberal Party. Howard from the start was Mr. Reliable, stable, usually underestimated, and made treasurer, interestingly, by Malcolm Fraser after only three years in the federal parliament. I lived through and reported the political careers of Keating and Howard in their tribulations, their triumphs, and their tears. And let me tell you, I respect both of them for the 27 and 33 years, respectively, that Keating and Howard devoted themselves to public life. For me, they go together. They always went together. They come from the same part of southwestern Sydney. They were children of the 1950s Menzian age. They were raised in the same generation. They came from families of four children, fathers, dedicated to small business, mothers dedicated very much to their children and their families. Keating and Howard were raised in the age of white Australia, full employment and the convenience of male dominance. They were raised in households that believed in Christian values, 
personal responsibility and that everything you achieved in life was by dint of your own hard work. Both became tribalised very early. They came from political families, Labor and Liberal. As young adolescents, both were committed to a political career. Neither excelled at school, yet both were driven, ambitious, and they possessed the capacity to learn and adapt. That both men leapt from the Sydney suburbs to the Prime Ministership in the space of 25 years testifies to Australia's truly remarkable democracy. Divided by tribe, personal temperament and a number of political values, they were united by generation events and common challenges. Their careers were intertwined. Their rivalry and their undeclared agreements were forged very much in a fire and in a passion, working against one another across the chamber, yet striving to find policies that worked. They fed off each other. And for a while in the 1980s, they became allies for a short period of time, and there'd be joint Keating Howard parties, would you believe, in Old Parliament House. These two men ran the Australian Treasury from 1977 to 1991. First Howard, then Keating, unbroken, a total of 14 years. Then they ran the Prime Ministership from 1991 to 2007, unbroken. First Keating, then Howard, a total of 16 years. As Prime Minister, Labor was Keating and Liberal was Howard. We saw the total capitulation of party identity to the will to power of Keating and Howard during these periods when they were Prime Minister. Their fingerprints, their branding, their beliefs run all over modern Australia in terms of the time they put in as treasurers and as Prime Ministers. Where they agreed on ideas, those ideas are entrenched. An open economy, tariff abolition, termination of centralised wage fixation, an economic nexus with China, integration of the US alliance and Asian engagement, Medicare, and a progressive income redistribution. Where they disagreed, the unresolved legacy was inherited by Kevin Rudd. Aboriginal reconciliation, the Republic, trade union powers, the history wars, and the balance between social libertarianism and social conservatism. For me, Keating and Howard were authentics. They were always good company, always fierce advocates, yet remarkably open about their aspirations. I always enjoyed talking to them both, and I spent many hundreds of hours over the decades talking to them both. With Keating and Howard, what you saw was what you got. While ruthless pragmatists, they were conviction politicians. And it's true to say that in the end, they both died for their convictions. They constitute a political style that is probably gone forever. My book is about two men, but it's more than just about two men. It's about the ideas that have driven modern Australia. I want to say something about how I framed the book. I believe that leadership matters. In my view, we have a system of prime ministerial government, not presidential government. The prime minister, if he chooses, can put his stamp on the country, and both Keating and Howard did this. Why else would you aspire to be prime minister? My book does not denigrate politicians or political leaders. I believe they should be evaluated coolly and rationally on performance. I distrust sweeping criticisms of politicians as a class. I have no time for armchair moralists who condemn politicians as immoral while refusing to evaluate the real world and the actual political choices 
the politicians faced. The book accepts neither the Labour nor Liberal view of history. To me, such acceptance is a caricature and always makes for bad history. I operate on the principle there is no monopoly of good public policy or virtue. I think Australian journalism is focused too much on politics and not enough on government. It's easy to write about politics. It's much harder to penetrate and write about how governments operate and how we in fact are being governed. Uh, this book is unmistakably about government and for this reason I think and I hope that you will find a lot of new material in it that you haven't been familiar with before. I date the start of the modern age of Australia in 1983 with Bob Hawke's election and while I'm alert and I document many of our failings as a country, I do believe our national progress has been substantial since 1983 under Hawke, Keating and Howard. My title is The March of Patriots for two reasons. The more obvious and less significant reason is that Keating and Howard were both patriots in their projection of national unity and their sense to cultivate a deeper sense of national unity. And both were, both were deeply preoccupied by that, although they had different perspectives. Keating was a patriot who wanted to remake Australia as a republic. Howard was a nationalist who wanted to keep a distant monarchy but enshrine the Prime Minister as the key ceremonial as well as executive agent. But the more substantial reason for the title is my unifying theme that in this period a distinctive Australian policy model was being devised for success in the globalised age. For me, the Keating Howard model didn't borrow from America, it didn't borrow from Asia, it didn't borrow from Europe. It was, a, it was a distinctively Australian policy model that reflected our culture and characteristics as a people, designed to try to make Australia a successful society in a more challenging globalised age. One proof came in 2008, when the global financial crisis hit and the Australian economic model proved far more resilient than the, than the economies of America and Europe. There is a constant and healthy debate in this country about economic growth and egalitarianism. There is no ideal balance between them. But Australia has struck merit, I believe, in an arrangement in which we have avoided the grossly inadequate United States social safety net while also, to a considerable extent, avoiding Europeans' stultifying regulation and government intervention. And it must be said, Keating and Howard, to a great extent, agreed on that sort of trade-off. In every area of policy, the Australian model is distinct, even in its failures, in particular in its inability to come to grips with the plight of Indigenous Australians. Let me summarise the essence of my argument about Keating and Howard. I think that they both aspired to renovate the decaying beliefs and ideologies of their parties for a new era. In my view, Paul Keating tried to find a new light on the hill for the Labour Party around his ideas of a market economy, an Asia-Pacific identity, the Republic, reconciliation and social inclusion. This was his big picture. While Keating's light on the hill was extinguished with his 1996 defeat, his ideas endure as a legacy that Australians must confront and must address. For me, Keating's tragedy, in particular between 93 and 96, was the man who was once a genius at devising a political strategy to fit in with his policy strategy failed completely to devise the political strategy. In relation to Howard, I argue that Howard is the most important liberal leader since Menzies. I think he remains poorly understood and poorly analysed. And I might just develop a few points here in relation to John Howard. 
Uh, the Liberal Party has always been a vehicle for leadership. Every successful Liberal leader reinterprets the party in terms of his own philosophy, and that's what Howard did. He came to office in 1996 without any master plan, yet there's no doubt when he finished, when he finished, there was a clear set of ideas that John Howard stood for. And I summarise those ideas under four headings. I think Howard was an economic liberal. He was an economic reformer. Look at the record. He went for work choices, tax reform, the GST, the job network, privatisation, selling Telstra. This is a radical change agenda, hardly the work of a conservative. So he was an economic liberal and reformer. Secondly, I think he was a social conservative and he turned social conservatism into an ideology of attack, not some obsolete notion that was wrapped up and finished. He upheld family values, he promoted massive family support off the budget, but he took ideas such as personal responsibility and mutual obligation as the spearheads of turning social conservatism into an aggressive ideology that did capture Labor by surprise. I think Howard has got to be seen as a cultural traditionalist. He championed the idea of nation, border protection, ANZAC, the Western canon in education, Christian values and Australia's British heritage. He believed the culture war was real, and that the qualities that many Australians loved about their country were under sustained attack. And finally, I see Howard as an agent of national security vigilance. Howard pioneered the idea of Australia as a leader in its immediate region and as a follower of the United States through the alliance outside the immediate region. Witness East Timor as an example of the former and Afghanistan and Iraq as examples of uh, the latter. Howard is tricky to interpret because there are two instincts he has all the way through. He has the instinct to be a force for stability, particularly after Keating, but he also has the instinct that he wants to impose fundamental cultural and economic change on the nation. Now these are his two cores. Remember, he said at the start, we have not been elected to be a pale imitation of the government we have replaced. So I think in Howard you see institutionalised this conflict between his quest for order and his belief in change. I think the balance is quite clear. I think Howard is overestimated as a conservative with far too much emphasis put on his support for the constitutional monarchy. When you analyse the record as I've done, I think he's more often than not a change agent. The task then, of course, is to evaluate the changes that he stood for. So to sum up, in the end, Keating and Howard were both rejected by the people. Neither had the popularity of Hawke or the political command of Menzies. Both generated a lot of division and polarisation because they were tribal warriors. Australia will be better off if, the, if there are limits to party partisanship and these limits are contained. Ultimately, however, Keating and Howard left a big footprint on the nation. It's a legacy that's impressive, contradictory and incomplete. Now it's over to Kevin Rudd. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for setting the scene and it's given us all a lot to uh, kick off a discussion. We'll now ask Tony Abbott to maybe offer a few thoughts by way of an initial reply and then we'll start to unpick it a bit further. So would you welcome Tony Abbott? Well, thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, Misha. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many intellectuals out on a Saturday night here in Melbourne. It just goes to show that Melbourne is... Uh, the city of ideas, uh, doesn't it, Misha? Indeed. And your paper, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, has, uh, has done its best over the years uh, to uh, 
dampen down the good ideas that Paul's paper has had, I suppose. But <laughs> look, um, everyone who tells a story tells it for a reason. Uh, the Bible storytellers want us to get closer to God. Shakespeare wanted us to understand the human condition. And Paul Kelly wants us to be a country which is better uh, than it currently is. And all of Paul's books are about telling the story of how politics has changed our country, uh, preferably uh, for the better. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to this uh, latest uh, Kelly book, uh, The March of the Patriots. Paul is a journalist, but he hasn't just been a chronicler. Uh, he has been someone who tells us what has happened, but more importantly, he has told us what it's really meant. And my read on what Paul is telling us tonight uh, is that Paul Keating and John Howard were reformers. Uh, they were change agents. That's what they had in common, and that's what distinguishes them from so many of the other leaders that we have had, both Liberal and Labor, uh, over the years. Um, Keating, uh, as Treasurer and then Prime Minister, he deregulated the financial markets, uh, he cut tariffs, he started the process of privatisation. Uh, Howard uh, continued the process of privatisation, massively built on the process of economic reform, uh, of industrial relations reform, and began the process of welfare reform. And these changed Australia. These changed Australia. Uh, as Paul said, um, we are, though a small country uh, and a small economy, uh, in so many ways uh, the strongest uh, economy in the Western world. Um, Kevin Rudd will tell you uh, it's all because of his economic and political artistry, uh, but the reason why we have avoided a recession, if we avoid a recession, is because of the legacy uh, of Paul Keating, supported by Bob Hawke, uh, and of John Howard. And I got the impression, uh, listening to Paul tonight, uh, and I suspect uh, there will be a strong impression uh, to this effect from Paul's book, uh, that we now have, uh, since 2007, uh, pygmies trashing the legacy of giants. Because what are the big ideas for reform? What are the big changes which are now being talked about in our political arena? Um, I didn't agree uh, with Keating's cultural agenda, by and large, but they were big changes. Uh, I supported uh, Howard's cultural agenda. Uh, and don't forget, uh, and I think Paul has put his finger on this in a way very few people previously have, Howard was a patriot. Howard was a nationalist. Uh, he didn't want Australia to become a republic, but he wanted us to count for something in the world. Uh, and in East Timor, for the first time in Australia's history, uh, we shaped uh, the history of another country in a very significant way. And I suspect that we have been more significant uh, to the history of the world uh, in the last seven or eight years than perhaps at any previous time. And that was only possible because of the work uh, of Keating uh, in economic reform and then Howard in uh, consolidating and extending that economic reform uh, and I think also helping Australians to believe in themselves in a way that perhaps Keating's more divisive style uh, had, not, uh, had not helped. So, Paul, um, I ask this big question, you know, what are the ideas that will make Australia strong in the future after a reforming quarter century which has left Australia in an extraordinarily strong position, uh, both economically uh, and in terms of its standing uh, in the wider world? And now, I've been told by Louise Adler that I must talk about my book, uh, not Paul <laughs> Kelly's book. So I have a book called Battle Lines. It's out there. 
uh, and it talks about my big ideas for the future, um, a more uh, accountable government uh, by giving uh, the national parliament um, authority over the state parliaments. Uh, I talk uh, about um, more accessible institutions uh, through uh, uh, giving public hospitals and public schools governing boards. I talk about more productive people. Um, yes, we do need to go back to the workplace relations changes of the Howard years, uh, but we need more people, and that's why we need to get out of this uh, uh, crazy uh, phobia about middle-class welfare uh, and start recognising those who produce the next generation uh, of Australians. Uh, these are my ideas uh, for the future. I don't know what yours are, uh, but we do need big ideas for our future. And if I may say so, uh, to Glyn Davis, who uh, chaired the uh, summit uh, that we had back in uh, April of last year, we don't need a thousand ideas for the future. Just a half a dozen will do. Big ones that are really going to make a difference, uh, and I'm afraid... Uh, uh, that is the big problem with the current government. Um, it doesn't seem to have any big ideas. Uh, to the extent that it has any ideas at all, uh, they seem to involve rolling back uh, the reforms uh, of the last government uh, and imposing a massive new carbon tax uh, on our economy. But I'm not making a party political statement no, tonight. <laughs> I'm saying that as an author, not as a politician. Um, <laughs> but that is our challenge as we move forward uh, to have ideas for the future uh, on the same scale uh, that Paul Keating and John Howard had the ideas that have built a very strong present.